welcome to the second day of our joint workshop uh, on Wise and YouTube. Today we have a very exciting day. I think that everything that we are going to present today is new and we have not presented this kind of material in the previous workshop and we are very excited about that. First, we will present a uh, advanced, advanced introduction to LU2. This is mainly focused for developers, but we will also explain some of the new capabilities in the ANSI simulation. And then, after a short break, we will jump to advanced topic in point wise. We are going to speak about three decks. Uh, we will chat a little bit about the scripting and uh, grid quality. Finally, at uh, 1.30, we will finish today. So let's start with the workshop. Uh, first thing that we have today is a advanced topic to a high-level source code overview by Anne. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. I guess I could give you just uh, another minute to, to finish settling down. Um, if you have a computer, please do take it out. Uh, not so much for this first part, but certainly for the second part of the talk that I'll give. Um, it'll be really nice if you can if you can follow along, uh, because we'll actually be diving into the source code to try to uh, develop some familiarity with it. So this is um, this is a high le high level source code overview, and we're calling this advanced topics in SU2. But I want to be clear about what that means, because yesterday we talked a little bit about advanced convergence strategies that we've developed for the adjoint equations or, uh, for instance, the surrogate modeling for optimization. Um, the topics that I'm going to be talking about are only related to the basic CFD solver. So they're not advanced in, in the same way that those research topics are advanced. But in, instead, what makes it advanced is that we're going to go deeper into the code and talk specifically about how uh, this, this particular solver works. So the goal of my talk is to describe the algorithms that are implemented in SU2 CFD. So if you're experienced with CFD, then this might just be uh, a list of the decisions that we've made to, to implement this particular solver. Uh, if you're brand new, hopefully this will show you something uh, a little bit about how, how to write a CFD solver and how this, how this one works. Okay, so we begin with the governing equations, and the governing equations are more or less the Navier-Stokes equations with certain variations depending on your problem that you want to solve. Uh, and you can write them in this way. Um, I have here uh, this first term is, uh, with a time derivative. Uh, these are what we call the conservative variables. So as I'm going, I'm going to be describing, uh, I'm, on, I'm not only going to show the equations, but I'm going to tell you what we call each term. Uh, so in that way, hopefully we can synchronize our vocabulary as well. So then when you go and you read the source code and you see something that's described as the conservative variable, well, you'll know what that is. Or the primitive variable would be something else. Um, the, the first uh, flux term here is the convective fluxes, and these are the viscous fluxes. And if you take these two fluxes together, we combine them into what's called a residual. Uh, and I've made an assumption here that we're solving a steady problem. Unsteady will be a little bit different. Santiago will talk about that later. So at each iteration, this is what the solver will do. First, it'll compute the residuals, R of W. And the R of W, as you can see, is all about the spatial residuals. It's convective and viscous fluxes, uh, and potentially source terms as well uh, for other equations. Uh, and then you compute an update to W so that we can drive R of W to zero. So in our steady state solution, this change in W will equal zero. At any given guess, uh, at any given moment that we might be evaluating it, we'll have some non-zero R of W. So after, once we've computed R of W, we're also interested in computing a correction to W to drive R of W towards zero. And so here's that same idea graphically. We'll start with uh, an initial guess for what our flow solution should be. And typically, that initial guess will be uniform flow. That's the most normal thing. We'll evaluate R of W, which means we compute all of the convective and all of the viscous fluxes. Uh, does R of W equal 0? Uh, usually, no. Uh, and when it doesn't, well, then we'll update W. Uh, we'll have uh, W at our next time level, n plus 1, which is equal to W at the previous time level, plus this delta W time. And that delta W will be computed. Uh, and when R of W does equal 0, we stop. So this is, uh, this is a very simplistic picture, and you might choose a different stop criteria or something else. But in general, this is the way that we're trying to solve the equations. Um, now, a distinction needs to be made between what are called primal and dual grids. So when you make your mesh, say, in point wise or, or however else you make it, uh, and you give that mesh to SU2, that, that mesh is what we call the primal grid. 
And so in this in this uh, picture here, I've used the the black lines. Uh, the vertices of the black lines are the are the vertices of the primal grid. Uh, and if you connect the midpoint of each one of these cells of the primal grid, you make these new shapes. And these new shapes are uh, make up what's called the the dual grid. Uh, and the dual grid, it's really important to understand what the dual grid is. Uh, I'm going to talk about the finite volume next. And the finite volumes that we're concerned with uh, in the solver are the finite volumes defined by this dual grid. So uh, just make a note of this notation here. I have this point I and this point J. And we'll be concerned about how to deal with the edge uh, that connects points I and J and the face between points I and J and the fluxes that, that flow between them. So let's talk just a little bit about the finite volume method uh, very quickly. Uh, so here is the Navier-Stokes equations one more time. Uh, and I'm going to integrate these equations over a finite volume omega i. So omega i uh, indexes the finite volume around vertex i in the previous image. Uh, when I do that, I get, I get this integral. And what we have in this term is the uh, divergence of a quantity integrated over a volume. And when you have that, you can use the Green-Gauss theorem to convert those terms into boundary integrals. So rather than needing to integrate over the entire interior of the domain, you can integrate over just the boundary. Uh, and we do that for each of the terms, and we define separate residuals just for bookkeeping purposes. So the convective term here, now I've transformed this into a boundary integral, uh, and I call this RC for the convective residual. And then the same thing for the viscous term, and I've defined a viscous residual here. So we need to compute the convective and viscous residuals. Uh, so it's nice to have just a little bit more vocabulary. So here is the primal and dual grid, as I showed before. Uh, and this uh, face right between I and J uh, is a, a surface. In three dimensions, it'll be an area. In two dimensions, it's just a line. Uh, that's what we're referring to when we talk about the face. Um, and the line connecting I and J, this is the edge, or the segment connecting I and J. Uh, and these are always line segments, even in three dimensions. And the points I and J themselves, these are the vertices. These are the vertices of the primal grid. Uh, and this, these are the locations where the data is stored. OK, so how do we compute the convective fluxes? So let's suppose we, using our initial guess, or we're at some iteration, we have solution data, and it's located at points I and J. Uh, we need the fluxes at this face that's between I and J. So these are the convective fluxes first. What can we try? Well, one thing we could do is to just average the solution, so wi plus wj divided by 2, and then compute the flux. That would be one thing that you might try. Another thing that you might try is to first compute the flux at i, and then compute the flux at j, and average that. Now, I provide both of these really as just an illustration, but the fact is these simple ideas don't really work well for convection. Um, and the point is that uh, you're you want better properties from your numerical scheme. And there exist schemes that have much better numerical properties. And just to give you an idea of what these might be, you want a scheme that's stable. You want a scheme that uses upwinding, so it only uses data that, does, that the flow itself has access to. You might want to capture shocks. You might want to have low dissipation where the, where the flow is very smooth. You might be able to go to higher order or something like that. And you might want higher order accuracy in general. Um, so what does SE2 implement? SE2 implements, well, this. This is a, a, a list of schemes, JST, Rho, HLLC, and AUSM. Um, all of these schemes are published. They're in the literature. You can find them in textbooks as well as in the papers. Uh, and they all have advantages and disadvantages. And really what you want to do is find the scheme that's appropriate for your problem. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that these bottom three uh, are not just first order, but we can also make them second order using what's called the muscle approach. And I invite you to, to look that up if that's something that, in particular that you're, that you're trying to learn more about. OK, so we've got convective fluxes. The next one, the next set are the viscous fluxes. So the strategy is similar uh, to the convective fluxes, but now we need the gradients, grad w. Uh, how do we compute the gradients? Well, there's two different algorithms. And the, the truth is, there isn't a single perfect way to take the uh, piecewise approximation that you have at each iteration and from it compute gradients that are going to be ideal. Uh, these are two algorithms, and, and they do both work. And one might work better for your problem, so you might just have to try them out. Um, but once you apply this, you get the gradients at, once again at each point. So the solution is stored at points i and j, and this, these procedures will give you gradients at i and at j. And so again, what about the face between? Because that's where we need the fluxes. So, so here's that face that we're interested in. And if you do what's called a pure average gradient, and so now this is the first naive method that I mentioned before, uh, this turns out to be uh, first order accurate due to cancellation errors. And what I mean by oops, what happened? Sorry about that. Um, 
so what I mean is if you compute the gradient at i and the gradient at j, and then to get the flux in between, you just take a simple average or even a weighted average, um, this is going to turn out to be first order uh, accurate due to a, a kind of cancellation error that occurs. So rather than pure average gradient, what we'll prefer to use is, is a corrected average gradient. And the way the corrected average gradient works is uh, for the component of the gradient that's parallel to this line ij, rather than use uh, this average gradient, we use a finite difference uh, approximation. So at i and at j, we have solutions, and we know the distance between these two points, so we can compute the derivative in that direction using just finite difference. Um, and, this, and this turns out to be second order accurate. And so uh, talk to Francisco if you want to even know more details about that. He'll show you a very nice example of exactly how, how to illustrate this, this point. But the, the, the takeaway from this slide is that uh, we want to use the corrected average gradient. And so when we go to the code, you'll see routines that say average gradient, and another one says average gradient corrected. Uh, most likely, average gradient corrected is the one that you'll want. And this is the correction that that's referring to. OK, so the next thing we have to do is time stepping. So, so at this stage, we've computed our residuals. We've computed our convective residuals. We've computed our viscous residuals. And so uh, we can compute R of W. Now, R of W, in general, will not be 0, so we want it to drive it to 0. So we want to compute a correction to W that, at the next iteration, will make R of W smaller. So here are our semi-discrete equations, which just means that they're discretized in space but not in time. So I've left the time derivatives here, but these terms are now discrete. And let's say we know how to compute these. We just we use the flux schemes from before. Um, we can, uh, let's take this, uh, this uh, integral here and convert it into, really, this is like a time averaged quantity. But, but essentially, I'm performing this integration using, some, in some sense, an averaged value of w. Uh, now, how can, I, how can I decide what w should be at the next time step? So the explicit Euler uh, method uses the w that's computed at the, correct, at, at the current time step in, in evaluating r of w. Implicit, uh, when computing r of w, you don't use r w from the present time step. You actually use w from the next time step. Now, w from the next time step is actually not known, so what you use is a linear approximation to figure out what w from the next time step would be. And this is, and this is how that works. So here, here is what's called the implicit Euler scheme. Um, I've uh, discretized the, the time term here. So this delta w refers to uh, the change in w between time n and time n plus 1. Uh, and then similarly, there's a, a delta t at the bottom. And this is going to be equal to uh, negative the residual evaluated at time step n plus 1. Now, we don't know what this is. That's still the problem. So what we'll do, OK, so this is the update, and this is the solution, and this is unknown. Um, so what we'll do is we'll use the Taylor series. Uh, take this wn plus 1 and expand it. Here's our, it's expanded about the point at wn, right? So here's the point wn, and then here's an added term. This here is a derivative in time, and we have a uh, second order error term. Um, and right, so this is so this is the um, this is the term. Okay. Um, so here's the solution of the current time step. And this this quantity right here is what's referred to as the Jacobian. And so in order to uh, to compute this um, in order to compute this implicit update, we need to compute the Jacobian. And, and so the way that this is done in practice is that as we're going through our convective and viscous and even source terms, uh, we're not only computing R of W, but we're also computing uh, the, the terms that go into this Jacobian matrix. We, we do those things simultaneously. OK, so solve for an update delta W. Uh, in order, so this is the previous equation, but I've, I've rearranged it so that uh, so that the delta w is standing alone on one side of the equation. And on the left side here, we have a large sparse matrix. So this is a matrix equation of the form ax equals b. Remember this from linear algebra. There are uh, many solution strategies that you can use to solve ax equals b. Um, if for an unstructured solver, this is going to be a very sparse matrix. And a, a nice way to, to go about these is using these, uh, what are called the, the Krelov methods. Um, and these are two of them that are implemented in SU2. Uh, there is a lot more to learn. So this was a pretty quick talk, actually. Um, so there is a lot more to learn uh, that I haven't talked about just here. This is just meant to give you the, the very introduction. But uh, SU2 is a multigrid solver. So at the highest level, what's happening is multigrid. There's a number of boundary conditions that you can use, depending on whether you're worried about internal or external flow. Uh, and there are even boundary conditions for, say, the mass flow 
in and out of an engine if that's something that you're uh, concerned with in your problem. Uh, I talked about the Krylov solvers. Krylov solvers uh, work better if you precondition the matrix first. And there are a number of preconditioners that are implemented for doing this. Uh, we have a few strategies for monitoring convergence. Uh, of course, the adjoint equations. This is one of the big selling points of the code, and I haven't talked about that at all. Uh, and there's also the incompressible solvers using what's called the um, artificial compressibility method. Uh, and I put a little ellipses because there's more that I haven't listed. And then the last one is perhaps the most exciting, which is your project here, right? So whatever, whatever, all of these things that that can be added to the code are added to kind of a basic skeleton uh, that does a CFD solution. And I think that if you can just uh, understand how that works, you're you're really on your way to being able to implement whatever solver it is, whatever it is for the project that you're trying to solve. So uh, with that, I guess my talk is complete, and I'll be happy to take any questions before moving on. Maybe we can just take a quick look at the agenda. So this is 15.45. Yeah, so I'm, I'm well ahead of time. So um, <laughs> I'll take questions, or, or we can move on, yeah? Can you talk a little bit more about preconditioners? Preconditioners, OK, sure. Um, so if you have uh, a, a Krylov solver, right? Um, uh, it tries to solve the equation AX equals B, right? Uh, sometimes the matrix A is not perfectly suited uh, for the Krylov solver to work efficiently. So AX equals B might be difficult just due to the nature of the matrix A, right? Now suppose that you can compute some, in some way a cheap approximation to A inverse, right? And we'll call that matrix M, right? So if you, if you knew A inverse, then you could do A inverse times A times X is equal to A inverse times B, and you find X immediately, right? Um, I'm not doing this on the board. The people on the webinar wouldn't be able to get it either, but just try to follow along. Now suppose I don't know A inverse, but I'm going to guess A inverse very cheaply, and let's call that matrix M. M is our precondition, right? So now where I was using A inverse, I'm going to use M. So now I have M times A times X is equal to M times B. Right? So I've changed the matrix. M times A is not exactly the identity matrix, but since M was an approximation of A inverse, it's closer to the identity matrix. And the closer to the identity matrix you are, the more efficiently your Krylov methods are going to work. So now you're solving a different equation uh, that's been preconditioned. You, you run the Krylov method. It hopefully converges faster than it would.